So why now? Why come out with the autobiography now? I got made the offer about four or five years ago, uh, so I knew there was the demand there, and um, I, I thought I'll put it, I'll put it off a little bit. But since that time, uh, it gave me an opportunity to kind of think about it and how to approach it, whether I could do it. I initially liked the idea of writing a book. I thought that would be a good challenge, and um, it never really occurred to me to get a ghostwriter to do it. Or I don't know. I seem to be. I thought that would be missing a trick somewhat. I know a couple of writers, real writers, and I know I've seen what it takes to write a decent book, the discipline and application and the whole process. So I was under no illusions that I was just going to be at a knock off an autobiography on the tour bus, say. So, there, so I knew that I would have to stop music for a while. So I gave myself, I thought, well, I'll make a couple of records. I was making the solo records and I wanted to carry on with that. And I just set this, this time aside which I thought would be good. And it turned out that, um, just totally coincidentally, that writing an autobiography now feels, it doesn't feel like, sure, obviously it feels like looking back, of course, but I've still got other things going on. I took a little break while playing with Hans Zimmer and the orchestra around Europe, which was amazing, whilst I was writing the book. And that gives, shakes things up a little bit. So I wrote some things in hotel rooms with Hans, but um, I'm glad that I've done it when I've still got lots of stuff going on, solo records and other projects. Uh, it's feel, it's, it's, it feels like just part of a one continuous story rather than the end of some, you know, tale. And you knew that the clamour would be your life with the Smiths to know more about that. Lots of the book is dedicated to the Smiths. That was only up to the age of 23. Mm. It, it, it dominates the book. Does that mm. bother you, that that will still be the focus of people's interest in you, even though you've done so much stuff since then? Um, it would if it was everyone's focus of my life, but it isn't everybody's focus of my life. The, it's the media's focus of my life. It's what will define me. I've made, I'm fine with that anyway, because I was in a fantastic band. Being, in a, being defined by something that happened in your, and was over by the time you were 23, um, is something I've kind of reconciled anyway. But to answer your question, um, there's loads of people who, who like loads of other things I've done. They like the, the fans of mine who follow me, and uh, music fans, I think, know that I've had this long trajectory and some of them like electronic and some of them like Modest Mouse. And believe it or not, some of them don't like the Smiths. And you've said in the book, part of being a great musician is being a maverick, an outsider. You've been in the industry now over 30 years. Do you still feel like an outsider, despite the huge names you've been involved with, despite all the years and your solo work? Ah, I think I do, yeah. I think I do feel like an outsider. Um, I think just because of my mindset, I think the, the kind of... Um, that's probably because of the culture that I came out of, the what became indie culture, which is now lots of things are the mainstream now. I think that is just the way, and particularly the way things have gone with technology and the internet. So I could write a whole other book about that, or someone else who's smart could write a better book about it. But um, I came out of a culture that was was about pretty much opposition to the mainstream. However, um, when I think when pop music or pop culture is at its best, films, particularly music, is when people with slightly, say, subversive or left-field, say, sensibilities do something commercial. That happened with the Smiths, we had hits. Happens with bands like Blondie, David Bowie, Pet Shop Boys, on and on it goes, Arctic Monkeys, you know. Um, I really like that about pop culture. I like that, that it can cross over and gatecrash the mainstream. And, and um, so, yeah, I, I, I've basically, been able to have a cake and eat it, which I think is obviously nice, but uh, it takes some doing. But if I had to choose one or the other, I'd definitely I'd be on the outside. Yeah. You talk about the very earliest days of falling in love with the guitar. What was it, the age of five, that just hooked you and has been with you ever since? I honestly don't know what I saw as a little kid, because I, I was looking at this little toy guitar and I had to have it and. My, my mother t talks about 
how she had to dr literally you know, pull me away from this window until eventually she gave in and, and bought it for me. I, I've, I've no idea why that is, because obviously it's got nothing to do with punk happening. This was in the late 60s when I was a little boy. Uh, I, I, do, I can only think it's some kind of esoteric thing or cosmic thing, because I didn't associate anyone with playing the guitar. My family were all very musical, you know, amateur musicians come from Ireland, but no one played the guitar. Maybe I'd seen it on television or something, but uh, it, I just had to have this toy and then I just carried it around with me everywhere I went. So I've never really had a... There's never really been a time when I can, that I can remember when I didn't have a guitar. And you described that, that desire to produce music as a vocation. That was yeah. it. You were completely focused right from the start. You knew what you wanted to do. Yeah, well, I had a, an incredible sort of passion and love for what music could do because it was all around me, because my parents were really into records and, and they were into singing and playing. Well, my, my aunt is particularly all sang. Irish family, it didn't matter whether it was a Wednesday or a Monday or a Friday or a Saturday. If there was a bunch of us together in this house, one, any one of the houses that we lived in, and a party would break out. Inevitably, people would sing. It was great. And I was, you know, a little boy, but I was uh, privy to all of that and seeing all of that and seeing the sort of wonder of it. And they were talking about very young, these very young adults uh, let loose in the inner city, you know. And uh, that really impressed me. But I love what songs did. I love what music could do for you. Some of it was very moving, some ballads, some of the introspective stuff that was sung and that my, my parents played, you know. Uh, it took me out of myself a little bit. It's, it sounds quite flowery and romantic, but I think that's an artistic impulse. Thinking that there's more to life than, than what we're seeing and wanting to express it. And when you hear it and you, you go, what's that? Uh, you just, I, I, in my case, it was better than everything else. Nothing to do with wanting to be a pop star or anything like that, at that point. But then um, I saw, uh, there was this Irish band that used to play at parties and weddings and all of that, and I watched the way they set up their equipment. And these men would arrive with their, uh, their amps and the guitars and the drum kit. And they set about it in a very professional manner and it looked uh, like a profession to me. So. I mean, I talk about it in the book that I think that's when it occurred to me that, well, if this is a profession, well, why would you ever want to do anything else? Because these people are getting paid for it. But I never, ever, ever wanted to do anything else. And the process of finding and meeting Stephen Morrissey, I mean, that might surprise people how quickly that just clicked. You knocked on his door and then it yeah. went very quickly from there. Well, so much is made of the differences in our personalities, which is there for everybody to see. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why we clicked. Um, but crucially, um, because I was so obsessive and desperate, really, the desperation came not only out of wanting to get out of the suburbs, but because I was so uh, romantic about bands and music and the need to do it. And also, you know, I was getting good enough on it. You know, people were starting to say I was good, you know, so I thought, okay, I can give this a go. It, it's got to happen. Um, that desperation, Morrissey had as well, I think. And part of that desperation came from, if it doesn't happen for me, I don't mean money, don't mean ambition. I mean living it, being able to do it every day. What am I going to do? Because I couldn't imagine anything else, you know. Just, just wasn't in me to, uh, to uh, be a person who, who in the 30s look back and say oh, I used to be in a band it didn't work out I used to be a musician and now I'm not and I think Morrissey was the same about being a writer a lyricist and a singer in a band so that's very fundamental and to find someone else who's got that fundamental flaw almost if you like not able to have a future without it was really amazing and the fact that I could write music that he wanted to sing on and vice versa was yeah, amazing thing. And the fruits of that bonding that you had so quickly happened so quickly. You had these four albums which were just so incredibly mm. successful in a space of five years. Yeah. That is so unusual. 
Well, one really... hit, huge hit yeah. after another. Well, the Smiths were really driven to work. Uh, we were driven to try and do something great. The work ethic comes over. I mean, this does yeah. not sound like it just happened. You were spending mm. hour after hour after hour in the studio. You didn't emerge into daylight. No, I'm still like that now, really. And, and I'm very grateful to have a life that I can do that. My life's led by work, and the Smiths were like that, particularly myself and Morrissey. Never had a holiday. Why would you want a holiday from the Smiths, you know, until five years in, when it would have been a good idea, frankly. But that's another story. But, um... We, uh, we, I think also the two of us, Morrissey and myself, knew what it took to, to be a great band and it took no slacking off. Uh, our heroes seem to be very prolific, David Bowie, uh, Roxy Music, people like that. And uh, we were in love with the ideas and the next idea. And I'd still try to be that way now. What's the next thing? What's, what's the next single? Well, what's it going to be? Being an artist, being an artist. Um, sometimes people think that when musicians say, I'm an artist, that it is pretentious or... Um, but I know a couple of people who are painters. A good friend of mine's a painter. And um, he, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't work like I did. <laughs> or like I still do, you know. Um, and if he does, you know, the idea of, uh, say, to an artist, the idea of going, stopping for two years to go off and buying houses and trekking around the Amazon and whatever. Like, why would you do that? You, you work every day. So in that respect, um, we, we were, you know, we were artists. You said at the time you had a feeling that what you were creating was really good. Yeah. You weren't surprised by the level of success that suddenly started coming at you. No, because I was, I thought we were really good. I thought what we were doing was really good. Uh, I don't think I expected the success. No, I don't think I expected that. You could tell. Yeah, I thought what we were, I thought we were good. I thought, yeah, I thought we were really great. But um, at the same time, the songs that we were doing in the early days were very odd, unusual, and it surprised me that we had early hits. This Charming Man <laughs> was our second single and it was a big hit and it's kind of defined the, one of the things that's defined the band. Um, it took Jeff Travis from Rough Trades went to hear it and say that's the next single. I never, I never knew, it was just, I just thought it was a great song or oh, a good new song. Um, let's, I think what it is, is half of me was being cocky and going, well, of course, we're brilliant, because I was young and cocky. And the other half of me, private half of me, was um, surprised that songs with our subject matter and without mm. long guitar solos and played, and some of them were very short and eccentric music, was getting in the charts. I mean, William, it was really nothing. It was two minutes, ten seconds long. We're almost daring each other to do weirder things but still getting the charts. And then we got on a roll and it just seemed like we could do anything. But um, I, th I think it's good to have, to have um, a lot of self-assurance, but uh, you know, some humility as well, I think. I, I wasn't not humble. What is more satisfying? What have you found over the years, working purely on your own or collaboratively, as you have done on so many occasions? I really like collaborating. Um, I think because I'm a guitar player and I was first known for being in a four-piece archetypal rock group that split up, it, it's taken people some time to, to realise that I'm actually more... I have more in common with someone like Brian Eno or Nile Rogers in that I, I collaborate. I think after 30 years of doing it with the, the and Modest Mouse and so on, and the movies now, people, people know that about me, but um, it was, it's not a, a sort of thing that guitar players are known for, particularly, particularly if you throw in, as I say, that I come from being in a band in the first place. It comes as no surprise to me, because before the Smiths, I was always in different bands. 
Um, but to answer your question, I, I think I thought I was done collaborating when I started doing my solo records. And you thought, well, okay, you can't leave your own band. But uh, I've, I'm just collaborating again now. My next thing I'm doing is with Maxine Peake, the actress, which is a collaboration. And I'm collaborating some more with Hans Zimmer on the movies. I've just written a song with Blondie. So, uh, so I guess I'm a serial collaborator. There's no getting around it. And you say working with Modest Mouse was one of your most rewarding experiences. What was it about that? It was the happiest time of my life. Really? Yeah. Well, it coincided with me. Um, my lifestyle really suited me. I, I got very fit, and, and uh, that gave me a good energy. Nothing to do with any my drinks, drink and drugs hell story or any, any of that business, you know. Uh, drink and drugs were great, but, um, and, but, and if I thought that drink and drugs would make me a good musician, I'd still be doing it now. I don't have any kind of puritanical regrets or anything like that, horror stories. But I, I, I thought it would be a good idea and interesting to really be able to run a few marathons and get fit and it would be a very uncliched way of living. I just thought it would be a more dignified and, and more productive way of being, you know, and, and different, different for a rock musician, you know, rock guitar player. And I'm a pretty all or nothing kind of person, so that coincided with me joining Modest Mouse. So I ended up like running 10 miles before a show and um, and running out in the snow and all of this before gigs. But Modest Mouse uh, were and are a very interesting bunch of people. Unfathomable music. Uh, uh, I was able to join that band as a sort of British guitar expert, in a way, that was my role. And it was pretty successful. successful. There's nothing like having an American number one album to get you out the house. Yeah. I would like to talk about your, your running and your fitness more in a little bit. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about coming out of the Smiths and, and moving on. You found words from Paul McCartney particularly comforting when mm. you were quite hurt about the process of, of what had happened. Yeah. Well, when the Smiths split, I had no idea what I was going to do. I, I didn't know that the phone was going to start ringing and Paul McCartney's manager was going to ask me to go and jam or mm. that... Um, um, I was going to work with all of the, with the pretenders and all of these things that happened shortly after. My band had split up and my friendships uh, were in tatters and the media were making a real meal of it. Some of the band were making a real meal of it. And um, I was 23. So it was a, it was, it was a tough thing. Uh, it was also very liberating because it needed to happen um, and uh, when I went to play with Paul McCartney for the day uh, which is, was an incredible thing um, we, were, we were playing and um, we got chatting and uh, I, he asked me you know what was going on it was Linda was asking me what was going on with me and everything and he was listening and, and I thought okay well I'll see if he can hit me up to any philosophical insight into what's going on with the breakup of a band. I thought, figured that if anyone knows and can give me some advice, it'd be him. I didn't ask him for advice, I just told him, and it, he just said, that's bands for you. And uh, it, it was actually uh, a, a statement you can't really argue with, because that's what bands are like, you know. There's, I thought it was good advice. And so I didn't really overthink it too much after that. But yeah, the period afterwards was uh, was amazing. And on the one hand, I was dealing with what I felt was like a hurricane of um, unpopularity, which was there in the media. And um, because you were being blamed for the breakup. Yeah, because I left the band. Yeah, which is kind of hard for a little dude to be fair to myself. Um, and, um, but, uh, but then, on the other hand, uh, I'd made a record with Talking Heads, and um, I didn't know what those first, where those first steps were gonna lead, but um, 
I just followed my nose and just, and then people called me. I got to work with Brian Ferry, and then, I think quite quickly after that, I joined the other. And then, uh, then I was sorted once I joined the other, because I was in a band with someone who was already my friend, Matt Johnson, and I was really supposed to be in the other before I was in the Smiths, but it was just the 200 miles from Manchester to London that stopped me doing that because I couldn't afford to get down there. And um, I felt like I was in my favourite band, and, and the, the, uh, it suited the, the that our backs were up against the wall, you know, because the media really gave us a hard time for me joining the there and Matt for harbouring one of the Smiths. And all it did was make us more strong and belligerent and and, and the, everybody came out to see us and we made a couple of great albums and all the shows sold out and it was fine. So I, once I got on that, it was all right. One thread that's constant throughout the book, with everything else evolving, progressing, changing, is Angie. Yeah. You talk about that relationship. That has been such a constant and it really comes over in the book, your amazing relationship, yeah. starting at 15 and holding firm through everything that you've been through. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing about doing an autobiography obviously is revealing unless you're somebody who lives their life in the public eye all the time, which I'm not. Um, but anyone who's ever known me will, will tell you that me and Angie are a pair. And um, we met at 15, she was 14, I was 15, and um, we met and got tight from the first moment. We met. Well, she, she, I had to run around, chase her around like an idiot for about six weeks, but that was her prerogative. You know, so, um, it worked. It, it did work, yeah. She knows what she's doing, but um, girls, but the... Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, the stuff with the Smith split, the formation of the, split, of the Smiths, being through all the journey that I've been on and everything, I, I've, had, I've had my partner with me all the way, you know? And she's, uh, you know, she's, she's a pretty kick-ass person. She, she, um, she likes good guitar music. She knows a good riff when she hears one. She knows a nearly good riff when she hears one and can say, make it sound like Iggy, which was good <laughs> advice. And, um, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very lucky. It's an unusual thing. I know it's an unusual thing to be with the same person for 30 odd years, particularly in show business. So yeah, she's the constant that runs right through it. And uh, well, obviously the most important person in my life, yeah. And did you worry that writing this book also mentioning the time you met up with Morrissey just a few years ago and even possibly discussed the, the mm. thought of getting back together as the Smiths. Did you think that this was going to whip up this hornet's nest of media questions again, that you've had all that time since, mm. of will the Smiths get back together? Yeah. You don't like that question. You hate well, being asked it, but well, you know it will keep coming. Yeah, I mean, I understand it, but I, in all honesty, I didn't expect that it would be uh, so... Uh, Focused, I know it's swollen. Um, it would be so reductive. I understand it. Um, but you know, 30 years into it, and this is the truth 30 years in, I know there are loads and loads of people who um, know the answer and they like what I'm doing. If that sounds defensive, it's not meant to. Not everybody is in the media. It's a media story. Lots of fans would love it, yes but not as much as the journalists love it. Fans don't really ask that question. They get their interest, the story gets, the narrative gets whipped up by the media, and I understand why, because it's a story, you know. But 30 years later, it doesn't really affect my life. I like, I'd like for the, the band to be friends, that's a different deal, you know. Can I ask you one quick question about the political situation we're in, in yeah. US elections coming up in a few days' time? The yeah, Smiths sure. so so well known for being political in their time. What do you make of what's going on? I think the times politically are horrific. I really do. I think that uh, the, the uh, rhetoric of hatred and racism and um, conflict it's just got really out of hand I think I, 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 I'm all for uh, democracy fantastic I'm really 
more than happy to live in a democratic country, but it just seems to have gone across the line when people are being slain on the street in the middle of a referendum. I mean, it really is going too far. And as far as Donald Trump goes, I honestly know that a pretty reasonable 12-year-old child would do a better job of running the United States than Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, that's all right. I didn't I get on to run. No, it's, it's fine. Over, you There you go. Hey, thank you very much.